Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Estrella StarPass webinar series for this month. I'm super excited, actually, because we have a guest who I know in a totally different capacity, um, personally, than, than professionally. And so tonight, I feel like I'm going to learn a little bit about our guest that I didn't know. So without further ado, I want to introduce our guest, Carrie Swedenborg. And Carrie is a doctor of veterinary med medicine. And I asked Carrie to join us because... What I've seen over the last couple of years is, um, and we were just chatting about this briefly, that we have students sometimes who come to us at Estrella and they are interested in a career or a pathway and often have maybe incorrect information about how to get there or they don't understand what they need to be doing as high school students or even early college students to be able to get to that point. So um, I invited Carrie to join us because she has a successful veterinary practice and she is, um, I can I can tell you just again, I mentioned I know her personally, I can tell you that based on your Facebook feed, at least Carrie, that you do actually really love animals. So um, I feel like that's probably checklist number one for people who want to go into becoming a vet. But um, I would love before we get started into like some of the questions I have, I would love for you to just share a little bit about you, where you're from, where you went to college, and just a little just kind of short overview of yourself, if you would do that. Yeah, sure. Um, I grew up in Akron, Ohio area, Chicago Falls. Um, and I went to University of Akron undergrad thinking that I would live at home and save money to go to vet school. I knew eight years would be a long time, but I did move out my freshman year anyway. Um, but I loved Akron and then got a biology degree there and then went to Ohio State for vet school. Um, and then now am in a Western suburb of Cleveland. Um, well, in Cleveland, right on the edge um, in a small animal practice with, with uh, like 25 other vets and been there since I graduated. 23 years ago, almost. So. And when you say small, you don't mean small in terms of the size of the practice, but small animals that you, small that you animal. were. Yeah. Okay. Dogs, cats, and then a little bit of exotics, like rabbits, ferrets, um, you know, guinea pigs, mice, stuff like that. So when you went to Akron, did you know that veterinary medicine was what you were planning ultimately to land in? Was that your plan? Yeah, like, so like most kids, I wanted to be a vet growing up. Um, and then most of my friends diverted to other stuff <laughs> and I just stuck with it. So when I was in high school and kind of thinking about things, I forced myself to look at a couple of different programs. Like I looked at special ed, I looked at architecture um, and they just didn't interest me like vet med did. So I went into Akron knowing my ultimate goal um, not everyone does, but, um, yeah, that was my plan all along. And I tried to divert myself or consider, but it didn't work. So what did you like about, and I guess, like you said, lots of, you know, kids growing up think about, and I, I, in full disclosure, my kids and I recently, we were looking at something that I had done when I was in elementary school, a little thing that I had written, and it was a little little book thing, and they had an about the author section, and in my about the author, it said, when I grow up, I want to be a veterinarian, and I even spelled it right, which was really impressive for whatever my age was at the time, but I, I think, you know, the reason why I wanted to be a veterinarian was I had a dog, I had mm -hmm. a hamster, you know, I thought that I wanted to be around animals because I loved them. But then I, obviously, as I got older, that is not the pathway that I chose. Um, part of that, I think, was I didn't really understand other than I didn't understand what veterinarians did um, in, until I was older and realized that maybe that wasn't for me. So as a kid growing up, obviously, you were someone who probably enjoyed you know, being around animals and, ha and having animals. But what was it specifically about veterinary because you mentioned those couple of other areas of interest like special ed like those are totally different so so tell me what was it that made you say this is what I wanted like this is specifically what I want to do and why um it's a good question so a big part of veterinary medicine is just the science and problem solving and always learning um I mean I've always loved my job and never really dreaded going to work, um, which I think is rare um, mm -hmm. for 
people in general. So, but I think the science of it and problem solving and learning, there's always more to learn. There's new medicine, there's new protocols, there's new techniques. And I think I saw that early on. I always loved science class. Um, I shadowed a vet for three or four days over my spring break in like eighth grade. And I came home I remember my dad would say, like, I came home, like raving about all these stories and surgery and blood and guts. And my, my family would like be disgusted and couldn't eat dinner. And I just kept eating and kept telling them. And I just loved the science of it, I think. Um, and of course, you know, the animals and stuff are a great part, but I realized that that's a small part. It keeps the rewards feeding as we go, but it's the science and working with the owners and, and um, working through problems and, and there's a lot of um, social skills, um, just working with different people and different emotions and different finances. And um, I don't know, I just saw some of that early on and I knew that I was still all in despite it's not all just keep dogs petting all day. <laughs> yeah, um, you, a lot of science. And I think that's what, um, what what kids should realize that they love it's not just all like being a hero and saving lives and petting cute animals that's a very small part unfortunately so well, that and that's i think probably one of the things that students who are thinking about a pathway in this need to hear you know unfortunately and you just listed about eight different skills that i don't know students really realize are involved with this kind of work. Like, and obviously you mentioned like problem solving, but you mentioned also like the financial piece of it, you know, and um, even having, you know, the ability to be it, it, sympathetic, empathetic to people, you know, go, it's a, a very emotionally draining job, I imagine, because like you said, it's not always saving and not always being able to have the end result that maybe families hope for and expect. I bet it's a pretty emotional job. Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's exhausting, <laughs> but, um, I've learned through the years to like put up a little bit of a wall. I mean, I love the animals. I love what they bring to their owner's lives, mm -hmm. but we're there to do the best we can. And, um, no one lives forever. And so I've, I've learned to kind of block off some of the emotions a little bit. And I think that's helped me stay super invested in the profession and super interested. I don't get too, you know, when I leave work, I can usually leave the sad stuff behind a bit, which might sound heartless, but it's also like a coping mechanism. And it's my mm -hmm. way that I still love going to work every day. It's never overwhelming <clears throat> to think about you know, what's coming. And it, it's, it's very emotional. We have a, honestly, this career has a very high emotional burnout and mental health crisis, but, um, there's a lot of resources ramping up because it's becoming more and more talked about. Um, but again, I, 23 years and I still love the profession and not all pets could say that, but I think part of my success is that I've just kind of walled off some of my compassion that I want to have, but take pieces sure. of it when it's there and when it's good. Um, and the sad stuff, we just do the best we can and um, know that it's normal life and normal, you know, nor normal trajectory of what's going to happen. And don't take it too hard, too personally. You can't save them all. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, super emotional. Um, but I just, I think I live for the challenges of the science and the problem solving and then, like I yeah. said, the cute little animals in between are super helpful. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure with all the, and thank you for mentioning even just the piece about mental health and the profession, because I, and, and that it's something that hopefully is being talked about more so that people can get the support and help that they need. Um, because I, I think probably with a lot of helping professions like this, that that, you know, is something that for years people didn't, you just kind of left tried to leave work at work and that was it, you know, and, um, but the reality is it, you know, probably it's deeper than that, but I'm sure in addition to the, the sad things, I'm sure you've had lots of really awesome moments. And like, is there like a moment of problem, you mentioned problem solving, like, is there any specific situation or do you memory that you have, like where you were able to problem solve and like, it was like a really great outcome? 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there's some every day, um, just trying to dive in deeper because majority of cases, I, I read what they're coming for and I can tell you what the problem will be. And, you mm-hmm. know, but every day there's a little challenge and it's just so rewarding, but there's probably cases I can count on one hand that were like ultra difficult, ultra challenging, very life threatening, but I could piece together some rare diagnosis or this or that and some super aggressive treatment and they pulled through and it's just so rewarding. Those are kind of my favorite cases ever. And the fact that the owners and I could work in conjunction and figure this out and then do difficult therapy and long therapy and the animals pulled through and, you know, it's just been a a rewarding career in that way because those those few animals that I've come across in that extreme I'll never forget um so and those are the ones that I can't keep my wall up <laughs> yeah um, one recently passed away and I just cried for like two days straight and that sucked but um he was a special little dog so I think you know there's always a challenge if you can dive into cases deep enough to really get in depth and think hard and not just always assume the easy way, the easy diagnosis, but there's a handful that have been extremely challenging. And when I can conquer those and help those, like those stand out as like my favorite in my career. So that's great. It's, I mean, and I feel like the students who are super analytical, who would do good in those like logic puzzle books, you know, like, I feel like those students would probably yeah. do really well as a veterinarian. Are, you mentioned, you know, shadowing when you're in eighth grade, when you were going through either undergrad, um, either during undergrad or grad or veterinary school, what kinds of like shadowing or internships or what, like, what kind of work experience did you have to, to get exposed to the, to this profession once you knew you were doing it, but what did you do? Was there anything specific? Um, so my childhood vet was always awesome. Every time I went, he would like show me stuff. And I think he helped fuel my fire a little bit. He was an mm-hmm. older gentleman, but then I did the shadowing at a different clinic, um, with some very more advanced medicine and stuff like that. It was seventh or eighth grade. I forget. And that just like sealed the deal. I knew that's mm-hmm. what I would do. Um, and then in, I think it was my first year of undergrad. Um, I asked my current vet, like, could I work here? And he said, Oh no, you have to have experience. I'm like, how do you get experience if you don't have experience? So I remember I made up like 15 resumes for every local clinic and my cover letter. And I'm like, I'm getting a job. I don't care if you have to have experience. And the first one hired me on the spot. So I worked there uh, my entire undergrad um, in the Akron area and they were a small clinic and, um, they just took me under their wing and like, I felt like it was just a really good family atmosphere. Um, husband and wife ran it and, um, it was just priceless. Um, he takes credit for getting me in vet school with his reference letter, (laughs) which are a help. Um, but then in like vet school, when I went down to Columbus, I also had a job like as an assistant. So I really only shadowed like one vet, And then from then on, it was all employment and you can get jobs at vet clinics relatively easily. You can start, start at the bottom. Like I did in the kennel, my daughter's working in my kennel. I call her my pooper scooper. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Lovingly, of course. (laughs) She loves it. Um, But you know, in the kennel or as an assistant, um, but a lot of places will do shadowing. We do tons of shadowing, tons of internships for tech schools, vet schools. We do externships. We're always offering shadowing opportunities for local high schools, for clients, kids. Uh, but I think all that is so helpful for them to see the the pace, the energy level, the sick animals, the well animals, cool surgeries, and um, just lots of perks, I think, to having shadowing hours just really gets you in there to realize it's, you know, it's not all cute puppies and kittens. <laughs> yeah. That's but. good to know for students that, that, and I know you're, I know you're one example, but I imagine that it sounds like from your, even your own experience that 
there are a lot of veterinarian offices that would be open to having high school kids come in and shadow to kind of see what the ins and outs are of, of working in that space. And so that's, that's actually really good advice. Cause I think sometimes we assume that you can't get, you can't do those kinds of things until you're in college and doing like a formal internship. But I think that early shadowing is good because it can, you know, give them a sense of whether or not they should continue on that pathway. Are so when so speaking of you said, you know, you bring in interns and all those kinds of things. What are the would there ever be something, or or, or maybe you have an example of this? What would be a reason why you wouldn't bring on an intern? What would about that person? Is there anything when you're inter like if you're meeting somebody and they want to come and shadow or intern or or be you know in this space? What would what would deter you from from wanting that person to come on? Um, not a lot because we have so many different kinds of people and levels mm -hmm. ages and all that. One that stands out to me recently, I didn't experience it directly because she shadowed on a Sunday, but our rule, it's a liability. And if an animal bites or if there's an injury, you know, we have liability insurance for our employees, but these shadows, we could be sued, you know, mm, yeah. so our rules with shadows is you can't touch the animals. Like there may be an occasional doctor saying, Hey, listen to this heart. Hey, look how cute he is. Hold him for me or, you know, whatever, but you can't touch the patients. It's a huge liability. So this one shadow, she was there two hours and we just had to cut it off because she wanted to touch every animal in the hospital. She wouldn't mm. respect our boundaries, our rules, um, you know, just putting herself in harm's way and stressing the animals out doing it. So we had to kind of cut that off. But if, if shadows will respect our boundaries and our, our, what will allow them to do, they can see a lot and um it's just hands off and so they can see a lot they can do a lot we have them in surgery we they have they're looking in abdomens we're showing them this is the spleen this is a bladder they can go back and see a dog in our treadmill that does you know rehab they can um you know all kinds of stuff but they have to listen to what we ask of them and keep themselves and the animals safe so what are the things what are the skills that you think what do you, what do you really like seeing when you have, for example, a high school student who comes in and they want to shadow or spend some time? What are the things that you're like, yes, those are, this is what we want to see from those other than not touching the, the patients. <laughs> um, but what do you, what skills are, what would you like to see? Um, I love when a shadow is super enthusiastic and has questions and, and I mean, I'm an introvert. So if I were 16 standing there in a busy busy practice I don't know if I would be this amazing but some of them come in like so curious and so excited and so many like good questions and and they listen to the results and they um you know they ask to get involved if if we haven't drugged them into something and then we have others that just kind of you know stand in the background and we try to bring them in and they're not super receptive or they don't seem excited. I feel like I'm wasting their time. And um, so I think just enthusiasm and questions, there's no mm -hmm. dumb questions, um, you know, and there's lots to see if they allow themselves to jump in and enjoy it, you know? Yeah, that's good advice. So switching gears, because I think one of the things that we'll have a lot of school counselors, independent counselors that may watch this recording as well. And so as we counsel our students, I think one of the questions that we would get often is, does it matter where I go to school if I want to be a veterinarian? And like thinking of it at, in terms of like undergrad, does where they go matter or is it what they study? What, what kinds of advice do you have or thoughts on that? So it's a great question. So we, we have four staff members at our practice right now that are applying to vet school. Um, so, you know, and they come from different backgrounds, different experience levels. I don't know what the magic recipe is, um, magic formula. Um, I personally don't think your undergrad matters as long as you do the prereqs. I feel what matters most is not only the obvious like grades and test scores and stuff, but um, like people skills, the interview takes, uh, you interview with a few people and that takes, um, quite a chunk of the 
points to get into vet school. And then I am a huge proponent of being a well-rounded um, person with a lot of leadership and community service and things like that. And mm -hmm. I always lecture my shadows or my, my student, you know, my staff members or whoever, like really get some of that. It's not just, you, you have a requirement of having either shadowing or work experience in the field. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to have that, but what else can you bring? So mm -hmm. I, for example, had um, a 3.3 GPA in undergrad, 3.5 was the average for acceptance that, that year. Um, I got in first try. Um, it takes, uh, at my point, one out of 10 got in. I've heard it's one out of 20 or 30 now of vet school applicants, but I had a lot of community service, um, volunteerism, leadership, um, tutoring inner city kids, stuff like that, just in different work experience, not just in the vet field, some other little things too. So I speak from my own experience. I feel like my interviewing, I was a I felt like I really jived with both interviewers, even though they're very different people. I was able to mm -hmm. connect with both. And I feel like being a well-rounded leader and giving back to community is huge. So I don't know for sure. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's what worked for me a long time ago. Um, but that's what I tell my people is just, it's not how many hours you've worked in our clinic. It's not what your GPA is. It's like, all those little things plus so much more. So I don't feel like your undergrad matters so much. There are some that have pre-vet programs like Finley here in Ohio, but I don't think it matters personally. I think it's more your personality, your interview skills, your your life, what you've given to society, you know, how you can handle stress. They they work hard on trying to trigger some anxieties in the interviews and like how do you roll with that, you know. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a unknown formula, but I guess it's really my interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting about the interview part being so, so important. And also, like you said, the, the, the other things, because I think we often think about when you're applying to graduate schools or graduate programs in general, that they're, they don't care as much about like activities or leadership, you know, that they're really just looking at your college undergraduate transcript. And it sounds like that when you're in a, applying to a competitive program like this, mm -hmm. there's those other things that are differentiators, maybe, you know, yeah. that maybe all the students can bring in the academic piece, but it's really that, like you said, the, the maybe situational things in the interview that they give you that to see how mm -hmm. you react to things. That's really smart actually on their part, I think to do that. And just, there is there any kind of exam that you have to take for veterinary school? Was there anything that you had to do for to um, these days? No, um, it's been off and on through the years. Um, and I think it's and from what I know, it's kind of kind of like getting into undergrad now. It's like different test optionals or this or that. Um, but no, it's usually just a couple reference letters, you know, and transcripts and then, you know, a good interview and um I don't know percentage wise for sure, but I, I do believe it's one out of 20 or so, one out of 30, maybe depending on the school. Um, but yeah, it's just working on yourself as a individual. And, and again, I'm just speaking from my sure. experience and from what I've seen on who does get in, I just think your interview skills and your, your experience in life and all that is just super, super helpful. So I always try to tell people to broaden their horizons and do more for the community and, you know, just be more broad spectrum mm -hmm. in your interests and your efforts and the way you spend your days. So how did you end up choosing Ohio State? How did you end up choosing what school you went to for veterinary school? Um, so looking back I don't remember ever considering any other school <laughs> um there's the, at the time I went to school there was only there were only 27 in the country and now I oh, think wow. there's 30 maybe or so um but I was also born a Buckeye and my parents met there and my <laughs> brother and my uncle like to me I was going to go to Ohio State and I don't I know I didn't apply to any other school my backup plan if I didn't get in was to go down to Ohio State and start a master's program and apply again. So I don't know, I was just all Ohio State. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, luckily Ohio State's one of the best. So I think I 
narrowed it down pretty well, but um, there's a lot of good vet schools. There's a couple in the Caribbean that have a little bit higher acceptance rate, um, but your debt is a lot higher um, and it's potentially not as high a level of education. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're a hard worker, you can get in there, improve yourself as to be a great vet. So it's nothing super negative, but yeah, I don't know. I was just, I was born a Buckeye and <laughs> I never, um, never changed my path. So well, it's not a bad place to have your veterinary mm -hmm. degree from. So that's, you know, we're <laughs> lucky here in Ohio that we have it right here. Yeah. So, um, wow. well, one thing, the last thing I think that we'll, we'll end on is what is there, is there any piece of advice or something that you wish someone had told you either when you were in undergrad, getting ready to go to veterinary school or even in high school was, is there anything that you feel like students who are thinking of pursuing this pathway need to know? Like, what is something that you're like, you, you just have to know this piece of it. And I wish I would have known it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so they didn't touch at all on business. Um, mm. And these days, more and more vet clinics are corporate owned. So you don't have to know as much, but there's still a good number that are privately owned, including mine. So that's something that I kind of just had to learn as I went. And luckily I was in with a partnership that as a group, you know, we really adapted well and learned that, but there was really no mention at all of how to run a business and mm -hmm. how to keep people happy, staff, clients, yeah. anybody. Um, so I think now they're starting to incorporate a class or two here or there, and that helps, but just being open to the fact that that's a big part of work. Um, so something that I didn't really realize or have any training on is, you know, dealing with people, communication, social skills, business, all that sort of stuff. I was like, save the animals and science is cool. <laughs> um, yeah. That's, that's really good advice, actually. And I think that's so applicable for a lot of professions where people, where students don't realize that, as, as, especially if you aspire to be the boss or to, to run something that you, you know, even if you're not, even if you are a, you know, second in command in, in a, in an office of some sort or a business or something like that, you do need to know a lot of those things. And like you said, the communication skills piece, we often find ourselves telling our students that good communication skills are a must no matter what you do. It does not matter what profession you are in. You have to be able to communicate and also communicate across different socioeconomic levels, um, cultural level. I mean, all kinds of things that that's so key to success in a lot of professions. And I agree. I wish every every major pathway included some finance or business type classes, you know, something so people could understand how, you know, how to read, a, you know, banks and profit and loss statement, even you know, like whatever, like you know, understand those kinds of things. And also, like you said, like um, interpersonal communication with people and clients, you know, that's obviously something that I think everybody could benefit from. So that's really good advice. But um, well, is there anything in terms of professional development that I know this, my last question was my last question, but professional development, how do veterinarians stay up on like what is new? And obviously you've 23 years, you've had to, had to have seen like, crazy changes and things because of technology and advances and things like how do you stay up on that stuff um so we're required to have 30 years oh shoot shoot <laughs> 30 hours of ce every two years okay. um, small percentage of that could be online or reading journals but um just going to conferences like oh, I, um down in columbus there's an excellent one and you just pick your tracks that interest you um, there's always tons of online stuff. So a lot of that comes down to like, how motivated are you too? It's easy yeah. to get 30 hours, um, but I'm still kind of a nerd and I like to read and learn. So um, if I ever have a moment or if I have a interesting case, I dive in deep and I just learn everything I can and, and use that for other cases. And so, but with the internet these days, you can you could study forever and not pay a dime, but yeah, 30 hours of CE that is a little more specific. And, you know, so I learned a lot through that. And then the rest of it, just, I motivate myself to 
stay interested and try to stay up with trends and learn the new stuff, learn from our new hires. Like they could be my own children at this point, yeah. um, <laughs> new grads bringing in like new concepts, new meds, new drugs, new protocols. That's trying to be open-minded to that. Not stuck in the old school method. <laughs> Yeah. I feel that way about the college application process <laughs> with our oh, with our kids having to learn all these changes and things that, you know, and I'm a nerd when it comes to visiting college campuses, I feel. And that's part yeah. of our professional development too, is like staying up on things like that. But I, I actually enjoy that stuff. So um, yeah, if you love your profession, if you are somebody who enjoys what you're doing, then that stuff doesn't feel like work, right? It doesn't feel like it's something like, oh, I have to do this, right? So that's great that you still enjoy doing those things. And and it is funny that, you know, learning from from the new the students coming <laughs> out, like, you know, learning from them. Um, well, that's great. Well, yeah. Well, I really appreciate you sharing all these things with us about um pathways, you know, what it, what your path was to becoming a veterinarian and some of the realities, which I think again, sometimes, you know, we try not to sugarcoat things when we have guests song we want them to share it as it is and you know there's some realities that I think students should be aware of before they start down a path um are there any alternate pathways or uh, not alternate pathways to veterinarian but alternate careers that you think if somebody was contemplating becoming a veterinarian are there other jobs that are are not becoming a veterinarian but something tangential something that like if someone likes what you do but isn't quite ready for that kind of work something else are there other jobs like related yeah um i mean there's vet tech which is just a two-year program mm -hmm. um when we have shadows that are considering that i really really want to talk to them um because the the classes you learn in vet tech don't transfer to to the doctorate program um when you are a vet tech, there's some areas for like leadership or a lot of um, our VTs, registered veterinary technicians, kind of like our equivalent of a nurse, but it's a two-year program. There are some opportunities for them to get into research, which a lot of our employees have done in the past, but it's, it's a, it's a career I want people to really think through because it sounds so much easier, like two years and you're done. But the income is obviously not there that it is for vets. Um, and it, it's a lot more physical in the long run. We examine the animals and, and use our heads and they're the ones wrangling them for toenail trim. So I want to make mm -hmm. sure they know what they're investing two years in. And it's sometimes a great match, but I just want to make sure it's it's not kind of a stepping stone to veterinary medicine doctorate. Um, a lot of people just like medicine as a whole. So if they don't get into vet school, they'll go to med school, which is less competitive um, mm. to get in. So that's kind of an alternative. I see some people go. Um, can't those really, are, I mean, yeah. those, just those little nuggets of wisdom right there are, <laughs> are awesome. I mean, that's great information yeah. to know. And I think the vet tech piece, that's, something I, I didn't realize that, you know, in terms of the, a lot of the differences that you just mentioned. Yeah. So I think that's super helpful. Like you said, that they really need to understand what those differences are. It's not just an easier entryway to that yeah. kind of work. So that's really helpful. Well, well, this has been great. And I, I learned a lot myself. So, and I, I still, even though I, third grade Christina wanted to be a veterinarian. I think, <laughs> I think I, I probably chose right. And, um, even though I still do love science, but, um, but I appreciate you taking the time to be with us and thanks to, um, everyone for watching this evening, or if you're watching the recording and if you have any questions or we can help with anything, please reach out to us, um, info at astrolaconsulting.com. And, um, it, again, Carrie, thank you for taking the time. And I hope this is a relaxing part of your day and was a little bit of a less stressful <laughs> part of your day. We appreciate all the knowledge that you shared with us. For sure. I love it. I, all right. Thank you. So consider. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your night. Bye. Thanks.